Hello, everyone, and welcome to the A3 webinar series. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, How New Innovations Remove Obstacles to Automation and Accelerate Adoption. My name is Clarissa Schwendeman, and I am the Director of Marketing for the Association for Advancing Automation. I'll be serving as your moderator today. Attendees viewing this webinar are in listen-only mode, which means that you are muted. If you have questions during the webinar, please submit them in the questions panel at the right of your screen. We will try to address as many questions as we can at the end of the program. And if your question is not addressed during the webinar, the RAPID team will respond via email. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. This webinar has been brought to you by the Association for Advancing Automation, also known as A3. A3 is the leading automation trade association in the world for robotics, vision and imaging, motion control and motors, and the industrial artificial intelligence technologies. We are your hub for all your automation resources, from products to partners to new applications, trainings and information on the latest technologies and innovations. You can visit automate.org to learn more. I would now like to thank our sponsor of today's webinar, RAPID's mission is to provide manufacturers with a robotic solution that can be deployed against simple tasks in hours rather than weeks at a fraction of the cost of other automation solutions. Their product is a fully integrated robotic arm work cell that is trained to perform tasks out of the box and learns new tasks via their cloud infrastructure, AI, and computer vision. Rapid Software provides their customers with an intuitive interface that gives them the tools to deploy and redeploy Rapid's automated work cells on their manufacturing lines without having to be a robotics expert. Rapid's platform is powered by AI and computer vision that drastically reduces the complexity, cost, and time typically required to set up a robotic arm. Rapid Solution is proven to deliver increased profits and decreased costs, making their solution indispensable for the future of manufacturing. Thank you, Rapid, for your support of today's webinar. Now, now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Um, we have Juan Aparicio, the VP of Product at Rapid, joined by Mandy Dwight, who is the VP of Business Alliances. And we have Kim Losey, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Rapid. Welcome, you guys. We're so happy to have you with us today. And Mandy, I'll now turn the floor to you. Thank you so much, Clarissa, for the warm welcome. Uh, we're really happy to be here uh, today with with you, A3 members, and and anyone joining. Um, you know, we have some interesting things to talk about today. Um, you know, we'll start very much with with kind of. Um, you know, the hope, right? There's some new innovations out there that can remove obstacles to automation and really accelerate adoption. And we're going to talk about that with you today. Um, but of course, you know, let, let's start with the bleak, right? We always start there. So, you know, we're in an interesting part where we have manufacturing that really is in crisis. Um, you know, I'm not going to belabor it a lot, but we all know that, um, you know, we have a machine operator shortage. Um, and American manufacturing um, is really at a, at a crisis point. Um, at Rapid Robotics, you know, we're really looking into this. And we did a survey of about 300 um, executives at the manufacturing level um, to see, you know, what they're looking to solve in the next um, 12 months. You know, where are they seeing the challenges? What would they like to solve? Um, and, you know, you know, I've take, taken a lot of time in my career to really dig into, you know, walking factory floors, listening to companies, you know, listening to their challenges, and really providing to, you know, support to companies like that. Um, so, Kim, I mean, on the leadership le level of Rapid Robotics, you know, you and the team have done a lot of digging into this, and I, I just want to ask you a little bit about, you know, this survey and and your thoughts. You know, any any surprises? Uh, you know, what are you hearing from companies based on this? Yeah, I think you know what what stands out to me. I've I've been in manufacturing related roles for about 25 years, so for a long time, it's no surprise to anyone on this call. You know, we've been talking about cost savings and efficiency, and you know, companies are looking at recently everything from you know how do I lightweight my products to reduce costs, to reduce material costs, to reduce waste. Um, you know, we're looking at efficiency in terms of simulation, plant or facility planning, 
how do we squeak every bit of efficiency out of the process that we can but what really stands out to me is you know all of this is it i don't know how much difference it makes really if we don't have people to actually do some of the work um, and as we look around some of the challenges we're you know we're really focused on how do we eliminate those barriers so that we can have um, a productive efficient hybrid workforce you know with both humans that are doing really complex human tasks uh, and machine operators or robots that are doing things that you know frankly robots are can easily and were built to do yeah There's absolutely some, and oh, this is sorry, kind no, of, gonna, no, no that's okay some of the statistics here, you know, are again, no surprise to anybody. You know, the labor shortage is severe. Right now, we're, I think, estimating 865,000 open machine operator positions in the US today. And of course, it's not just a US challenge, um, but that is projected to be 2.2 million by 2025 and potentially as much as 4 million by 2030. And, and you know we dig into what's going on and we all know that there are a lot of people not coming into manufacturing you know it's not the most you know there are a lot of people out there doing awesome work actually trying to get the next generation excited about what's happening in manufacturing but the truth today is the average machine operator is about 48 years old and for every 10 that are retiring one new person is coming into manufacturing in these simple machine operator positions uh, you know, so we're facing this this potential for mass retirement in the next five to seven years. And we all feel it in manufacturing, but don't necessarily look at it at an aggregate level. And if you look at all of these manufacturers, there is a huge impact to the GDP of this country. I mean, we're looking at potentially one point, you know, a trillion dollars of lost revenue a year if we get to that point of four million operator shortage you know by 2030 so it's significant um, and i think that the uh you know the the supply chain is really a huge you know the disruption of the supply chain is just creating this this huge challenge exacerbated you know by by the manufacturing the labor shortage um, i think there are you know prior to the pandemic i think that it was something that we all looked at and how do we make our operations more efficient? How do we make them more um, environmentally friendly? But we didn't, all, not all of us were thinking about, you know, something as simple as a remote control. If I can't get the button for my remote control, I can't get my remote control and I can't get my TV. And it just brings everything to a screeching halt, um, which I think is one of the biggest challenges. So we really need to figure out how do we solve this? How do we make it possible for manufacturers to sure up that supply chain, to bring their manufacturing back, um, in this case, to the United States, um, and help their businesses and their communities thrive? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the things that jump out to me on this slide so much are, you know, the average age of the machine operators who are ret retiring and then, you know, the worker shortage. And of course, you know, to lead into that, you know, there's such a labor shortage and, you know, Rapid Robotics, we, we asked some of our, our top customers, you know, if you're unable to find machine operators, you know, how will this affect your business? I mean, any thoughts on this, Kim? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I think I'm a, a person I love. I love helping businesses grow. Um, and this thing, you know, the inability to meet growth targets is terrifying to me, to be honest, because I see all of these small and medium size and even large companies that are working so hard to be able to not only keep their business running, uh, but they, you know, they have big aspirations to help their communities thrive and to help the business grow. And they can't do that if we don't fix some of these fundamental problems. Yeah, absolutely. And we said in this this webinar, we'd, we'd start with kind of the, the bleak, the manufacturing in crisis. But, you know, now I want to pivot a little bit to talking about, you know, some of the solutions and, and really spend the majority of our time together really focusing there. Um, and robotic automation is really critical. And there's new innovations that certainly can can change that and help. 
Um, you know, and Kim, you know, this is an interesting stat here that 80% um, of common tasks um, can be done by robots. Um, you know, what exactly does this mean for manufacturers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when we look at you know, problem solving as we were building rapid robotics and our, our co-founders were looking at how we can bring new innovation to the robotic space, we really started looking at this kind of bottoms up approach and looking at the fact that so many of these tasks are simple, repeatable tasks. And they're kind of the things that, you know, nobody thinks to automate because they're so obvious and so basic and they're low margin tasks. Um, but we think that that's where there's a really big opportunity. It is, you know, an opportunity to use technology to be able to accelerate automation um, and get these robotic solutions out into the hands of manufacturers so that they can free up labor to be able to do the things that are more difficult in manufacturing. Yeah, absolutely. And now, you know, Juan, I want to um, kind of bring you into the conversation here. Um, something that you've always said to me that's been really interesting is you see robots as a force multiplier for facilities um, that are struggling to maintain fully staffed or operate it at full capacity. And Kim, you, you touched before on not being able to, to meet your numbers of production. But Juan, what does that force multiplier for robots, you know, really mean? Thanks, Mandy. Thank you everybody for attending this this webinar. Uh, as you can see, I'm very well surrounded by Mandy, Kim, and her dog, who is also very excited about manufacturing. So uh, yeah, force multiplier, right? I think this slide says it all, right? Why if the majority of the tasks are easy, relatively easy to be automated, but still 98% of manufacturers don't have a single robotic arm. And I think uh, it is about a different mindset, uh, building the mental models that are different when you hire uh, a, a robot, and I use the word hire, hiring here, versus hiring a person, right? And thinking about is one-to-one -one replacement is probably not the right uh, mindset. Actually, it's a, it's a multiplier, because what you are doing is actually enabling the workforce that is working with you to be more efficient is enabling them to be more excited to come to work and not doing the same repetitive tasks, but actually working with machinery, with robotics, with high-end technology like AI computer vision and feeling empowered to do better their jobs. So what we have seen is two kind of uh, people that want to automate, two types of customers. The first one comes to you with, okay, I this is my high ROI task and I want to automate it and I only care about that. It's the only thing that I care. And if you cannot automate it, buy. Now, the other people that we see, so this is very hard, right? Because a lot of times you are in a road to to failure or to disappointing, disappointment, because usually those tasks, the high ROI, your dream task, is usually very hard to automate. But if you open your door, and this is now the second type of customers, that they open their doors and say, okay, come to our factory, and this is, the application that I want to automate, but if you see something else that you can automate, go for it. And this is the success, right? Because then we find the tasks that are difficult and say, okay, this technology is not right there, but look at all these other tasks, right? <laughs> what we like to see is just be on top of a table, look on all the tasks that are in, uh, in the factory and say, okay, which are the ones that really can be automated by a robot? And turns out that the, in all the factories that we have been, there's always a task that can be automated. The difference is that there is usually a person doing that task, right? So why don't we automate that task and move that person to the task that you're having hard, uh, a problem to, to find operators? And that is, the, that is the game here. It's also about thinking uh, of robotics and automation, not just as a, okay, I buy a robot and I program it. Because if you introduce automation in an inefficient process, it's going to highlight the inefficiency, right? It's not going to be your... Uh, get your operations better. Actually, it's going to get it worse. But if you have already an uh, uh, optimal process, automation is going to highlight the efficiencies and it's going to make you thrive, right? So that's what we see that people that implemented the wrong actually get it worse. They have a bad experience with robotics and a bad feeling in their mouth that lasts for years. And that's what we are fighting now in the, in the market versus the people that says, okay, 
well, no, this is a, this is a transformation, it's a digital transformation of my operations. It's about rethinking the way that I produce my products and the way that I engage with my customers. It's, uh, it's tapping into opportunities for growth, it's tapping into opportunities to keep my people engaged and move into the future because I know as a manufacturer that in five years, if I don't automate, I will be out of business. So those people that go into the conversation with a mindset of help me transform my business, also the processes, they are the ones that succeed and start automating immediately, not waiting five years to this magic plan that never realizes, but start changing and digitalizing and automating right away. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Juan. I mean, you said a couple of things that were really interesting there is there is almost, you know, there's many things in a facility that can be automated right now. And the companies that are not doing this, you know, may be in trouble and may be left behind in their production. So with that said, this is, you know, robotic automation is such an absolute game changer. So why are people not doing this today? Uh, you know, Kim, are there any thoughts that you have on why companies are not, you know, automating right this minute? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the high cost is a is a huge one, um, but kind of more obvious. But I think when when you think about robots, you have to think about, you know, not just the robotic arm, but you have to think about the end effectors that go into it, the cost of bringing somebody on to execute and plan your systems integration. Um, you then think also typically these are robots that are then bolted to your floor. They are lacking flexibility. So if you, you know, are a, a even small and medium scale business and that where your your production or a contract manufacturer where your production is maybe not as predictable as you'd like, it really is a hard ROI calculation to justify when you look at that cost and then that lack of flexibility. And I think more recently, because of the supply chain, lead times are also becoming a huge, huge barrier. You know, we talk to some customers um, that are waiting months to even be able to get solutions or design, automation designs. And then, you know, in some cases, more than a year to actually get the hardware in stock. Um, and there's just so much complexity and a lot of manufacturers have, you know, CNC machining experts and they have, you know, uh, experts that are solving all kinds of other things, but they don't necessarily have robotics experts and they don't realize what kind of maintenance it actually takes uh, to reprogram, whether you're reprogramming or, you know, somebody bumps a machine or you need to adjust something for cleaning or repair, then it requires retraining that robot so that you can get the kind of precision that you need for manufacturing. And it's hard. So it requires this expertise that a lot of companies don't have. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to go back to something that you said, Kim, um, flexibility. Um, you know, there's a lack of flexibility. And Juan, I want you to weigh in on this. I mean, why is lack of flexibility of a lot of robotics and automation, why is that a, an obstacle for, for businesses? Yeah, good question, Mandy. I think the uh, automation has been very unproven. I mean, it's completely one of those technologies that is completely under hype. I'm talking just about the automation part of things, right? It's about, my favorite videos are those that you see producing, how, did, how is this made? And then you discover how wonders and how much ingenuity people put to, to build the stuff. And it has been extremely good to automate the predictable, right? To do things that are really low mix and high volume, like automotive. Like those industries have been uh, automated to the limit, right? Everything that can be automated is automated in, in those factories. Now, what about the, low mix kind of or the high mix low volume kind of application that is the majority of, of manufacturing right yeah. besides uh, you have the automotive assembly but all the tier one suppliers their uh, business changes from quarter to quarter right and if you make a huge capex investment to automate a specific task you may it's very difficult to justify first of all the roi right and then second is if you have to program like 250 different SKUs, the bill that you're going to get from your system integrator is not going to be pretty, right? It's going to be on the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, now, then that's one limitation, right? I am a, one of uh, a manufacturer that want to automate. Uh, but the reality is that the technology so far 
hasn't been for me because the, uh, I need to make a big capex investment. I have the risk. You also mentioned, Mandy, that if I need to fix something or reprogram, I'm, a, I'm on my own. And it's not just reprogramming the robot, right? It's probably also designing a different end effector because my parts are different. How do I do that, right? It is about training my quality again uh, for new parts. So that's where technologies like what we have built at Rapid Place uh, in here, right? I think uh, Kim can talk about one of our customers that uh, they went with us, they hired one of our robotic machine operators. And then uh, because they got a big order from one of their customers, right? And yes, uh, life happens and they lose that order. And then what? <laughs> like with the traditional automation without flexibility, you will be a stick with that piece of automation that probably you have to throw away because you don't have the capability to, to retrain. So what this customer did, and Kim can say better than me, they call us and said, hey, uh, your robot has, uh, they put a name, I think. Uh, Kim uh, yeah, Ness, say it better. so it was uh, Tammy Barris, the, the president at West Tech. She names her robots. Many of our customers name their robots. And she called and it was a COVID chip they were producing. And they had a huge order that was canceled. And, and she called and she said, Nancy need, Nancy's out of work. We need Nancy to get a new job. So then we were and able then, to retrain to do a new task, um, you know, in a matter of, I mean, I think it was a couple of days, but uh, Nancy was retrained back up and running um, and helping West Tech win new business. Yeah. So going back to your question, Mandy, I think uh, now moving on, if we really want to unleash the power of automation to this 98% of the people of the factories in the U.S. that don't have any automation or robot, then we need to add flexibility. And uh, we were gonna talk in a second about the technologies that will enable that, but also a big part is not only the technology, is having a partner out there that you can call and say, yes, change this, right? My my operation conditions, my operating conditions are changing. Can you uh, come with me and help me continue being in business and continue growing? Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I loved hearing about that customer that, that both you, Juan, and Kim talked about. And I think about how that customer would have de dealt with a, a complex deployment, um, you know, purchasing the equipment and, and having it on site. I mean, is that something that the customer, you know, could have done? Or is this something that worked better for them because of the flexibility and the, the lack of complexity when they needed to program for a new task? You know, I think I think that leaders across these companies have so many things that are like they're running around like their hair's on fire for a number of different reasons. They don't it's not that they can't do it, but they don't really have the it's not the biggest priority. Um, so I think that that's why we see a lot of customers, you know, that have that have tried automation or they've tried cobots. And we see it sitting in the corner or in a closet collecting dust because something exactly like this happened. You know, they put in the investment, they got the solution. It was a very narrow, focused, specific solution. Conditions changed and, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily worth the investment to then reprogram uh, the robot under these, you know, normal conditions. Yeah, and that really brings us to, to why we're hosting the webinar is traditional automation at times, you know, there's been challenges, um, you know, for, for these reasons that we've talked about. And that really leads us to the whole, you know, point point of the webinar and, and how we can really remove those, you know, for customers. Um, and as far as, you know, recent innovations that can actually help a customer to adopt automation quicker, uh, deploy faster, get, you know, ROI quicker. Um, so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, removing these obstacles. Um, you know, Juan, um, you know, here, here's a, a slide that, that talks a little bit about AI and computer vision. So I want to turn this over to you to, to really walk us through um, how innovations like AI, like computer vision can really, you know, support customers of all sizes. Thanks, Mandy. So if you were expecting to join this webinar with uh, like how 90% of other uh, technology companies talk about AI saying, okay, AI is the silver bullet. It's going to solve all your problems. You don't have to worry. AI is going to take care of uh, your production problems. Then you are in the wrong way. I mean, that's, that's not true, right? Uh, 
AI is has been overhype over the years, and but the way that we, but it still has value, right? It still has a lot of potential. And um, what I will try to do in the next 20 minutes together with Mandy and Kim is kind of demystify the technology, but also talk about what technologies are really opening doors and opening uh, capabilities for adding that flexibility that we just talked about uh, and helping SMEs and all kinds of manufacturers to, to automate. So when we talk about AI, yes, you can think about the current state. Oops, sorry. Um, sorry, Juan. <laughs> don't worry. You can put uh, different videos in the background. They always make better when they, <laughs> when I'm talking over, over robots moving. Mm -hmm. So the, um, uh, there are different areas, as you can see, right? Uh, that are really ripe for uh, for uh, for applying those technologies into manufacturing, and where we have seen, for example, a big um, a help of uh, computer vision into adding flexibility in manufacturing is things like what you see in in the video right now. We call it a smart setup. But what it really does is using computer vision to detect those fiducial those markers that you see in the in the picture. That is a uh, known, it looks like a QR code, right? It, it's a known pattern that the camera can uh, uh, precisely locate and then load whatever task you need to, to be running. Uh, and that's very important, right? Because our customers don't always run the same machine and the same task. And then for them, it's difficult sometimes to say, okay, yes, I love the, the robot, I love this task, but there is i can only i only run this operation once a month like one week ago a month the other three weeks is doing something else and it's very difficult to justify putting two robots can you help me and that's why we designed this technology using computer vision we can localize precisely where the parts are where the, what uh, task you are running at that point in time and the robot will completely move all the waypoints and reposition itself to uh, uh, run the new task after you have moved the robot. Now, if you go to the next uh, slide, as I said, there is no magic here, right? And the difficulty in um, uh, in our uh, scenarios in manufacturing, in particular, that is very different than logistics, is that play, picking is not only the is not the end of the game. Placing is also very important. So that's why we design the systems not with an algorithmic point of view, but from a system point of view. And what you saw right there, and you can play it again, is an example of how we achieve sub-millimeter precision. It's not only with the computer vision algorithms, it's also with active fixtures and uh, intelligent design of our N effectors and of fixtures that uh, put the part into the sub-millimeter precision that our customers are requiring. So going back to what AI can do today, um, there are scenarios where combined with intelligent hardware design to can achieve this uh, kind of holy grail of robotics that has been for a long time that is grasping any part and being able to place it with precision. That's very different in logistics. What we have seen in logistics also with many other companies is that uh, AI has made a huge impact, uh, a huge wave there because the picking is not that important or the picking is important, right? But the placing is not that important. So you usually place it in a box. And that makes a huge difference because it doesn't really matter if you are slightly off, one millimeter, one centimeter off, as far as you have picked the part and placed it in, in a box, you should be more or less okay. The other area that we work uh, extensively with our customers is quality inspection. And quality inspection is also another area that is ripe for using AI or data centric techniques. Uh, Traditional, if you have done uh, machine vision, traditionally this is rule-based, it may struggle with inconsistencies that are the result of working with parts with complex features or ambiguous part defects. That's usually, I mean, if it's really easy to detect, okay, either you have a scratch or not, traditional rule-based machine vision works for you. But for a lot of our customers, they haven't been able to uh, do automate quality inspection just because it's very difficult to say, okay, it's very ambiguous if this part has a defect or not. But there are many companies now uh, jumping into that space, and we are partnering with those because a lot of their cameras, they need a robot to be tended. 
Uh, so this partnership of, okay, they run the AI algorithm for quality inspection. We tend the parts, they tell us if the part is good or bad. If it's bad, we put it on a bin. If it's good, it continues the process. That's something that also we have seen uh, a lot in, uh, in for our customers. So again, summarizing where AI can really make an impact, uh, there is no freelance, right? Uh, all of our customers want higher cycle time and precision. These two things, I have never met someone that says, I can run the robot faster. No, run it slow. <laughs> I just want to, to see a, a robot running very slow and not meeting my cycle time. That doesn't happen, right? So uh, in order to accomplish this too, you are gonna be much better, much faster if you can put, if you can uh, have your parts uh, in a repeatable fashion, right? That they are presented in a repeatable fashion to the robot and they are also presented in a repeatable fashion after the operation is done. So that's, but if you cannot control that, if you really need the flexibility and now is where AI or computer vision can make a difference. It's always, it's not, there is no freelance. So there is a cost because you need to add the cameras, you need to add the, the algorithms to, to support that. But that's today possible thanks to a mix of algorithms and uh, an effector and fixture design as you have seen in the video. Yeah, thanks Juan for I'm oh, sorry, Kim, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna add, I think important uh, Juan, I know you touched on it, but um, okay. all of these black components here that you see on the work cell are all custom fixtures uh, that we build as part of the process for our customers. So we can get that sub millimeter um, precision. Even the end of arm tooling is all custom for each job. Uh, we have a huge library of designs that we can modify to be able to produce to help hit those you know cycle times uh, and other requirements they're all 3d printed in our facilities um, using carbon fiber filament yeah, yeah and absolutely I, 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 I know that that's a quick point uh, mandy yes the because i talk about the things that ai can do right but still you wouldn't see uh, none of our robots manipulating very complex fibers or things that deform or cables. Those things are still hard for a robot and automation. They can be automated, but the cost to automate is usually with a machine that is purposely built for that task and is usually very expensive. So if you're a manufacturer and want to see if this company, this startup that is pitching this new technology to you, if you want to know if they are really good or not, just bring them to your factory and the first task that you show them is the hardest thing. Like show them a wire harness that you know that they cannot do. If they tell you they can automate it, they know that they are <laughs> they are not a serious business, right? But if they said, honestly, this is difficult, <laughs> but let's focus on this pick and place that is just things that you can see in the video, then they may be right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we joke around that, you know, um, if it's some, if it's hard for a person to do, generally it's hard for a robot to do. And I think you captured that really nicely with Juan, with what you just said. Um, and, and thank you both for walking us through, you know, your thoughts on AI and vision. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about digital simulation, because this is something that we do quite a bit for our customers. Uh, Juan, can you walk us through, um, you know, what this really means for customers? Uh -huh. Yes, so that's another of the technologies that is, uh, at least for us, making a, a big impact, right? It's, uh, first of all, uh, it's the, this software-driven production. That's what is driving our, the way that we, why we can deploy robots in hours and not in, in weeks or in months. Uh, it's also the, the connectivity to the cloud that enable us to uh, uh, really quickly, if there is a an issue with the uh, with robot, ninety five percent of the time just fix it remotely. But the other big uh, and then the AI that we just talked to get uh, the flexibility. Now the other big technology that is enabling us to move very fast and scale really quickly or really rapid, <laughs> as our name says, is uh, simulation and digital twin. For us, there is a uh, usually the the loop of uh, developing one of those cells if you have to wait until you have all the parts or until you have the machine that is going to be uh, attended by a robot is very slow right and the more you wait until you have to deploy to figure out um, mistakes 
uh, the higher the chances are that you're going to fail, right? If you discover something where you are deploying a robot, that deployment is going to take weeks, right? Because, and we want to minimize the time that we are at the facility of our customers because obviously we are impacting their operations. Uh, so the simulation here that uh, twin help us in the entire life cycle of our products. At the beginning, we what we want to do is we want to tell the customer, can we do your task with the cycle time that you're asking and with the reachability that you're asking us, or we cannot do it, right? This is a big, going back to, to the risks to our customers, this is a big risk of why people don't automate, right? Because if they have to do a big capex investment, they turn out that they cannot do it, they have wasted time and, and money. Now, for companies like us that we do robotic as a service, we charge you monthly, so if we, are in a situation where a robot doesn't work, then it's zero risk for the customer, but it's a lot of risk for us. So we say no to a lot of tasks. We review a lot of tasks, uh, but we are convinced that the task that we say, yes, we can do it. And simulation help us enormously because we can very quickly mock up what is gonna be what the customer gets and what is gonna be the, uh, the cycle time and reachability that they need. It also help us to be a partner, right? To show them, hey, this is how we are thinking about things. But there is tremendous ingenuity in our customer brains, right? And so they always come up with, okay, why don't we do that? Oh, now that I see it, why don't we, actually, I thought I couldn't do the fixture for the parts, but it actually is not that difficult now that I see it in simulation. So it also helps the customer to figure out in their mind, okay, before I have a person, I didn't know how this would look like. Now I see a robot doing the task and we can do very, intelligent things to meet the cycle time as you see here where we are picking and placing at the same time very complex uh, sim uh, things that we can only do fast in simulation later on it help us to program the robot very quickly and then finally when we deploy it it also help us to uh, as i said usually in our facility we are training the robots at our facilities either in in detroit or in uh, in san francisco so we may not have the machinery that we are tending at our customer side. We are not just, just buying a very expensive and complex CNC just for a specific project, but we can mock up the different IOs and the different reachability and the different scenarios and singularities of the robot in simulation. So once more, very helpful tool in all the, the entire life cycle of the um, of our process to deploy robots very quickly and also be, for us, highly integrated into the way that we program these cells and the way that we see products to our customers. Yeah, I think if you, yeah. I mean, the you know, the the operator shortage is so severe. Like we talked about in the beginning, we have to figure out how do we do this as fast as possible. I mean, I'm sure most of you on this call or on this webinar have ordered robots or been involved with robotics. And you know how long those lead times are. If we're gonna solve or start to shrink this shortage, we've got to figure out how we leverage technology to do it quickly. Yeah, and fully, fully, fully agree, Tim. And uh, I mean, if you think even pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, right? There were like a year around 40,000 robots sold. 40,000 robots. Like you think about how many uh, cell phones were sold and it's in the millions. How many computers in the millions? The same for automotive. But we read all the times and we see the statistics that there are factories out there desperate for robots. And the saddest thing is where you have fit, okay, we can do it. This is a feasible task. It also makes economical sense. But guess what? We are going to deliver that in 2024. That's what we are <laughs> competing against sometimes when we go to our customers saying, we get a quote. And they say that, yes, they can get this kind of simulation in about a year. And then the project will start in Q1 2024. So that way, yes, we are not going to address the millions of vacancies in, in jobs that, that we saw in this, the first slides. So how do we transform, instead of deploying 30,000, 40,000 robots, how do we deploy uh, 300,000? Like another zero at the end. I'm not saying in the millions yet, but another zero. That means you need, we need to design these cells and deploy them in weeks, not in months. And really, 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 really moving fast. And simulation is one of the technologies that enable us to do that. 
Yeah, and a lot of things were mentioned there. So we talked about technology and um, innovations. We talked a little bit about innovations and speed. You know, this, this technology deploys really fast. Um, there's other innovations really around business um, models that allow, you know, more customers to take advantage of automation. Um, and Kim, I know that you and the team have really built rapid robotics around, you know, some of these really different business models that allow really everybody, you know, it democratizes automation for a lot of these companies. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what the business model here is that's so innovative? Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, we've touched on a lot of these components, but, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation about RAS or robots as a service. And I think we're really trying to, you know, think about software as a service, obviously, as, as something to compare it against, but making sure we're delivering the service piece of it. I think that there's the, you know, the, the financing of a robot. So, RAS gives you the ability to sort of pay monthly. You're minimizing any upfront capital expense required, uh, becomes more of an operating expense, which in many cases is easier for companies to absorb. You know, it, it's just like paying a worker, a human worker, you can pay monthly a uh, robotic worker. But I think, you know, what's really important for people to consider is is the service component are you set up like even if it's inexpensive or a monthly bill that you can stomach can you sustain it do you have the partner that you're working with uh to be able to service your robots you know you want somebody that really is a professional extension of your team or somebody who's reliable that can be there um, to help you so thinking through that really what do you need in robots as a service to be successful um, and I think, you know, as we also think about it, we touched on this uh, throughout is, you know, I think we need to really rethink um, the tasks that we identify uh, that you can do with this kind of RAS model or as you're paying monthly and low cost solutions. If you're just really the goal to free up labor, you can automate these simple tasks and it doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, you can sustain them with a partner that is providing that service, and then you get this incredible return on your investment. You know, if you're looking at uh, a model like the rapid business model or the RMO, we call it the rapid machine operator, compared to the investment required for traditional automation or the investment that you're paying with a human operator, you know, they're, it's a seeing you know i mean looking at this chart it's a pretty easy um when you're just looking at this an easy decision i think the trick though is really finding those tasks and getting started i mean i think juan mentioned this as well we have so many people that we talk to that say oh i have a you know we'll, we'll do this i'm interested i have a five-year automation plan and you know i'm not sure how many of you on this this webinar but how many of you have a five-year automation plan that was dated you know, 2012 or 2015, and it hasn't hasn't started. You know, you're not alone. It happens with a lot of our customers, and it's because they're trying to think about these big, you know, monolithic, uh, lights out kind of initiatives. But if you think bottoms up rather than top down, you can start to make real progress quickly um, and see that instant return on your investment. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there are um, a lot of benefits to having, you know, this type of, of business model. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges right now for manufacturers and, you know, really bringing that back, you know, this is solvable and it's solvable, you know, uh, both Juan and Kim mentioned, you know, walking the floor, there are a lot of tasks that can be automated right away in a matter of two to four weeks with technology that is this flexible. Um, so, you know, just, just moving out there and, and talking about it, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things are, that are expensive and Kim did a good job of pointing out that the RMO, which is, which is something that we offer is, is very flexible and inexpensive and immediate ROI. Um, you know, Juan, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, the technology? This is one innovation. There's lots of innovations coming. Uh, what are your thoughts about, you know, where the technology is going on that for automation? Yeah, I think there hasn't been a better time in history to, to work in robotics. It's something that I've been working more than a decade and it's 
every day it, it amazed me on how new uh, advances, how the impact that we can make and that we are just at the beginning. Right? This, is, this is extremely interesting. We are riding a very um, positive wave for both vendors and users of automation in the sense that hardware is going down in price. And on the other side, technologies that are already mature, like software, like simulation, like some cases of AI, as, as we discussed here, are now making its way into manufacturing to tackle the high mix, low volume kind of applications that have been out of reach for many years for automation. And it's just, it's just the beginning. This is only gonna get better. And the important thing is separating the, the signal from the noise, because a lot of times it's not about the, the sexiest technology that makes an impact. It may be the business model that makes an impact for you. It may be the smart setup that, that I saw of changing uh, operators or machine operators or RMOs between tasks. It may be having a partner that if something goes wrong, you can call. And that capability, the fact that also is maybe not the super sexy thing, but the fact that all our robots are connected to the cloud in a secure and safe way. And that if there is a problem, we with 95% of the chances, we will be able to fix it uh, offline. And if we, in the rare occasion that we need to go there, we are there in two hours, having that capability that is enabled also with technology and with the business model, yeah, I think it's invaluable, right? So it's uh, the perfect time to automate. I and mean, the perfect time to automate was probably yesterday, right? So, but the second best time to automate is today. And as Kim said, right, uh, we can wait to make it perfect. And you can always think about that dream application that you always wanted to automate and continue working on that. But why don't you, I, while you are doing that, start automating, start your journey, uh, start the, the simple task, the pick and place task. And because those are, once you start a journey, you will see, okay, it's a different mindset of, oh, wow, I need to, to hire roboticists that can help me yeah, understand this complex task versus, wow, what is the next thing that we can automate? Let's do it together. I have now a team of engineers, of top engineers and roboticists out there that I can call, and they will help me automate this task. And if they cannot do it, they will uh, find a resource that can. And that's also the, an important message here of, it's not that the, that's also the nice thing. All the robotics companies, they are expanding the pie of automation. It's not gonna be a zero sum game. It's a really big pie for all the companies working together. We cannot do it alone. We partner with a lot of uh, other vendors to uh, accomplish the automation that is required by uh, our customers and the, the cycle times and the, the type of operations that they need to, to automate. So we are always happy to, to partner and to offer this kind of joint solutions to to our customers. And there will be tasks that are better for a system integrator because of their complexity. And there will be tasks, a lot of them, like we have seen that are uh, achievable with this pick and place. And there will be tasks that nobody can automate yet, but there will be a future where they can, but let not, don't be held by those, right? Because they, they happen in the future, they will happen eventually. But start automating today, that's probably my last sentence here is start today, call us, because what we love, what we really love, if you see uh, you know, that uh, what really uh, make our eyes sign is automating tasks, is going to a customer and said, okay, now you are automated, now you can get more business. It's not, it's not only the savings, it's the, the growth that our customers are achieving, like hundreds of thousands of dollars extra a month just because you have a robot versus a, a person. And going back to the first question, it's not really replacing one-to-one -one human. And like the people that work with robots, they're actually happier. Like we we have tons of stories from our customers that they're actually fighting to be the operator that uh, of the robot machine of, uh, of our RMOs because uh, it makes their life easier and they are working with high tech and they, they, they love it, right? So it's a different mindset and it's just the beginning. Yeah, Juan, you brought up a really important point about you know bidding new business. Um, I think that this isn't always so obvious, but it's important that we think about it, that we have customers who will now call us and say, I have this new task. I'd like to bid the business. Can you do this? So we work up a proposal and then they're able to go out and bid the business at, let's say, you know, the robot would cost them the equivalent of $4 an hour 
human labor. They go out and bid the business at $8 or $10 an hour, and they're winning versus business in Mexico, Malaysia, and other places. When you factor in all the tariffs and the shipping and the unpredictability, it really is an incredible way to start to really grow your business by you know just getting started. Yeah, absolutely. And and this slide is really interesting. This is a little bit more about about our company Rapid Robotics. I mean, um Kim, if somebody wanted to to get started, you know, have somebody, you know, come and you know have a discovery call, walk the floor, look for the the good places for um a rapid machine operator, you know, what would you recommend that they do? So rapidrobotics.com, um, or I think our, our next slide, maybe we have info at rapidrobotics.com uh, is the best way to reach us. Please, you know, we're really passionate about helping manufacturers be able to automate these simple tasks quickly, cost effectively, um, so that they can have a rapid impact. Um, so reach out to us, you know, we'll, we'll be checking uh, the inbox all the time, but also rapidrobotics.com. There's a get started button. Um, you can just fill out a quick uh, form and we will get right back to you within 24 hours to schedule a discovery call. And in that call, we look to understand a little more about your business, what you're trying to accomplish, and we can give you some instant feedback on what we can automate and what we can't. Rapid impact. I really like how, how you close that off, Kim. Um, and yeah, with with that said, you know, we'd like to thank you all for for attending the session today. Uh, we do have about eight minutes left for questions, um, so we'll open the floor up for for any questions that that you have. And Clarissa, welcome back. Uh, we'll we'll leave it to you to field the questions. You got muted. Oh, I'm muted. All right. <laughs> thank you, guys. Um, we've got a ton of questions, so I'm going to ask as many as we can. As a reminder to the audience, if we don't ask your question live, the RAPID team will respond via email. First question, in the RAS robots as a service model, where does the software simulation and front end services come in? There's a follow up question to this. How is this scoped in the beginning so the customer knows how much this will cost in the end? So we have a, you know, Juan jump in here too, but we, but we have a very um, straightforward model. So at Rapid, we have um, in our first year, we charge a flat uh, setup fee, and then we charge a monthly service fee, you know, for the support and the, of everything in the robot. So you know, um, it could be as low as a $25,000 one-time fee, and then $25,000 a year for your ongoing robot and service and support. So it's it's all in there. And that includes the end of arm effector, the design, the deployment, um, the simulation and training. There are no hidden costs um, in it. And, and you don't pay anything until your robot is working. Yeah, so there is no, you know, for the for the automation design, it's all factored in there. That's like everything is factored in there and that help us come up with a proposal with a specific price. So you know what you are getting. There are no surprises along the way. It usually is what Kim says. It depends if it's a, a straight, uh, like a gripper from a library, it's going to be cheaper. If it's a very custom made specific uh, gripper that we need to design with uh, a specific fix, fixtures or something that makes it more complex because we have to also purchase uh, third party equipment then it's going to be uh, higher than that on, on the fixed cost that you pay in year one. But that is obvious uh, in the proposal and very clear. So no surprises. You know what you are getting. And that's the value of also the simulation, right? That you are actually seeing it. This is, oh, this is what I am getting. And this is what I'm going to pay for it. But very good question. Thanks, guys. Our next question is, is Rapid Robotics or, or your service a direct sales model or do you work through local distribution and technical support? Um, so we handle it all ourselves. We really are trying to be a robotic workforce. We think of ourselves as a robotic workforce company and an extension of your business. And because it's another advantage of the RAS model, it's we're out of business if we're not helping you be successful. So we need to make sure you're successful it's in our best interest 
Um, and so we really rely on our teams of people. And we've been very methodical about how we've grown the business and expanded the business so that we're always within distance of our customers to be able to provide that instant support. Yeah, that's very important. Like we cannot, because we care so much about our customers and that uh, and it's contractual, the help that we have to, to provide to them. As Kim said, we are in driving distance. If there is a problem, uh, we immediately take a look at that. If we can uh, solve it with our software, we will remotely. If not, we are there in a matter of hours and out in a matter of sometimes minutes. But sometimes you need to replace a suction cup. Well, you, you cannot do it remotely. So we go there and do it for you. Like you can rely on that. And that's why still we do it in house because we care and that service has to be top for our customers. Thank you. Is there any maintenance needed for your robot and how does this take place today? Mm -hmm. So the maintenance, you know, we, we, they are all cloud connected. Um, so we're able to keep an eye, you know, we're able to uh, flag anomalies that may indicate that there is some problem. We've actually had an instance where we've been able to flag issues with other equipment that is not our equipment because of some of the data that is, that is coming in. Um, but we, uh, you know, there, there inevitably will be some maintenance and we're, we're loading updates to our customers uh, and to their robots through the cloud. And then if we need physical on-site maintenance, um, we'll be there to take care of that. But the contracts are um, typically two years. Um, and so within, you know, two years is very unlikely that there's a major need for maintenance. Mm -hmm. And let's say that, uh, I don't know, for example, the arm has a, uh, we don't produce our own arms, right? We, we source them from a third party, so from another company. So if there's a problem with the arm for whatever reason, we don't just go there and fix it and let you wait for a week. We go there, take out the arm, put a new one, and in a couple of minutes, you know, a couple, in a few hours, you're up and running. So that's also very important for us. And we, we work and uh, schedule those uh, service calls very closely with your customers so the impact is minimal but as kim said usually in two or three years uh, the company has been three years old so the, the the it's only we are only at the beginning but we haven't seen like the need for support is really sporadic thank you i'm gonna ask one more question um oh i have so many to choose from can you elaborate and advise what costs you looked at for that bar chart that showed total cost over 10 years and specifically that RMO was that the rapid robotics technology? Uh, yes. So I think that that was the, the RMO, the rapid machine operator. I think that I can't remember what the number on that chart was, but I've seen we've <laughs> created many of them in the past. So that would be um, the cost, the one time setup. Uh, and then the annual cost. So let's use the initial example I gave, $25,000 initial setup, $25,000 a year, and that is paid monthly, but then that over 10 years would be the, that's it, that's the cost for the rapid machine operator. There is no additional maintenance, there is no additional support, there is no additional you know, training and things like that. Um, and so then we were estimating you know, the cost of human labor at what would be just a fully burdened labor rate and i'm not sure if that particular instance was looking at one shift two shifts or three shifts but we do sort of look at that as well um, a lot of our customers are running two to three shifts uh, and then you're looking at not just the fully burdened labor rate but um you know i guess penalties or additional charges that you would need to pay for those uh additional shifts and then there's a lot of other indirect costs as well and then for other solutions, we were looking at kind of an industry average of, you know, what you would pay for um, a typical robotic arm, the end of arm tooling, the maintenance plan, the systems integration, the ongoing maintenance and things like that. Awesome. Um, Mandy, Kim, Juan, thank you so much for your time and your presentation today. Um, to our audience, I know we didn't get to all of your questions, but the RAPID team will respond to you via email. Thank you, guys. Send us an email. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
So coming up this Thursday, we have our next webinar, which is Unlocking Value Stream Productivity with Robotic Cutting. Robot Master will provide an overview of the latest cutting market trends, look at challenges fabricators face, and showcase technology that will help them unlock additional value from their current processes. You can register for free at automate.org. And I hope you found this webinar to be interesting and informative. If you have any questions about A3 or today's webinar, please shoot me an email or the Rapid Robotics team an email, and we'll be happy to get back to you. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded, and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you in the next 24 hours. Thanks again to Mandy, Kim, and Juan for sharing their time and expertise today, Rapid Robotics for their sponsorship, and to all of our listeners for your support. Stay safe and healthy, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.